Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Nice, nice to see you here, uh, our, our sweet little family. Uh, my name is David Ono. I am happy to say I'm not going to be doing the four o'clock show on Eyewitness News today. <laughs> I get to do this wonderful event. And uh, what a beautiful place this is. I have so many memories through the years. This is where we debuted our Heart Mountain documentary, where we've talked about you know, the Nisei soldier. We've had so many different conversations here. And this is a great forum to do it. Very impactful, deep, meaningful conversations. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, we were sitting here with the uh, former U.S. House Representative Adam Kinzinger, talking, and he sat on the January 6th committee, and he, you know, openly was willing to answer your questions, our questions, and talk about his experience during that tumultuous time in Washington, D.C. And this is the perfect forum to do something like that. I'm also a proud member of uh, Janum's Board of uh, Governors, and I'm, I'm so happy to be here to relaunch the Daniel K. Inouye National Center for the Preservation of Democracy. I mean, this was a great opportunity for us to continue to practice to say the most debated and difficult name in the history of the world. <laughs> Is it Inoue? Is it Inoue? The debate continues to this day. So, you saw the sign out there. Uh, I actually sat down with uh, Senator Inoue um, just a little bit before he, he passed away. And I had this great opportunity to not only talk to him about his life, but ask him, how do you say your name? <laughs> Inoue? Inoue? And he literally said, he said, David, you say it however you want to say it. I answer to it. So he really, he really didn't help any in, in that standpoint. But I'm going to go with Inouye today. Uh, and Senator Inouye envisioned uh, the Democracy Center as a place where people would gather to learn about the fragility of democracy and examine the constitutional rights and freedoms of all who live in the U.S through the Japanese-American experience. So at a time when American democracy is threatened by the spread of misinformation, racism, efforts to curtail voting rights, and more, the Democracy Center is a place of education and dialogue about the critical importance of democracy for all. I mean, we all understand that. That's what this community stands for, the past and the present, and understanding how things can go off the rails in a democratic world if we don't do the diligence and the work that we need to. To get us started, we have a special message from Ann Burroughs, Janum's president and CEO, to commemorate this special occasion. Please direct your attention to the video screen. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to welcome you here today as we relaunch the Daniel K. Inouye National Center for the Preservation of Democracy at Janum. I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in person, but I send my warmest wishes on what is truly a momentous occasion for us. The Senator envisaged the Democracy Center as a place where people can learn about the fragility of democracy and examine the constitutional rights and freedoms of all who live in the US through the Japanese American experience. Our revitalized Democracy Center builds on that vision. It examines issues around race, identity, and social justice. It explores the evolving idea of what democracy is and what it can be and what it means to be an American. It builds bridges and it finds common ground between people of diverse backgrounds and opinions. The Democracy Center's flagship programs, two distinguished lecture series that will center on the leadership values and principles inspired by the late Norman Y. Mineta and Irene Hirano Inoue. They will urge us to bring diverse communities together and advocate for positive change. And our newest initiative, the Toshizo Watanabe Democracy Fellowship, will promote democracy, leadership, diversity, and community empowerment through dialogue, exchange, and cooperation between early to mid-career Japanese leaders from government, business, media, the arts, and the NGO sectors, and their American counterparts. 
and our incredible and collaborative public programs and exhibitions like the bias inside us we hope will inspire all people to participate in the shaping of democracy going hand in hand with Janam's mission and willingness to speak out when civil rights are undermined and to share the hard-fought lessons accrued from Japanese-American incarceration history to shape a more just future. Thank you. Wonderful words from Ann Burroughs and as you can see, the debate continues. So I'd like to acknowledge our special guests for today, and you're going to hear from some of these folks a little bit later on. Consul General Kinko Sone is here. Consul General, great to see you. LA City Controller, uh, Kenneth Mejia, hiding around the back. Hi, Kenneth. You're going, to, you're going to meet Kenneth in just a second. LA Arts Commissioner, Randy Tahara. Randy? And we have Jennifer Sabas of the Sab Jennifer Sabas of the Daniel K. Inouye Institute. Jennifer, great to see you. And you've been here for Jennifer for just a little while. We also have the Nikkei Women Legacy Association. Thank you all. And we have Janum Board of Trustees and Governors throughout the house. Thank you all. We also have another video message for you from a special guest who could not be with us today. Here is a greeting from United States Senator Alex Padilla. Hi, I'm Senator Alex Padilla, and it's an honor to join you all today for the relaunch of the Daniel K. Inouye National Center for the Preservation of Democracy. Americans across the country look to the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles as a moral blueprint through the people we honor, remembering the mistakes of our past, and a calling for us to live up to our founding ideals. Today, the Daniel K. Inouye National Center for the Preservation of Democracy will again stand tall as a beacon for democratic principles and civic participation. Now, what better namesake to model ourselves after than Senator Inouye? And what better time to recommit ourselves to speaking out whenever our civil rights are undermined than now? While we may get too comfortable with the idea that our democracy is a given and that our rights are guaranteed, the last few years have been a reminder that we can take nothing for granted. We've seen bad faith actors, both at home and abroad, seek to inflame our divisions. We've seen increased violence and hate crimes towards Asian Americans and communities of color by those who seek to divide us. And we've seen partisan politicians try to make it harder to exercise the fundamental right to vote, particularly for underrepresented minorities. The preservation of our democracy is far from guaranteed. It takes champions for democracy like Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lewis, or patriots and public servants like Daniel Inouye. But it also takes all of us willing to engage and educate each other about the issues of the day. And it takes organizations like this to teach us that in America, we're made stronger because of our differences and diversity, and continue to instill in us the most basic lesson of our high school civics classes, that our democracy works best when as many eligible people as possible are empowered to participate. So thank you for all the work that you've done and all that you'll continue to do to bolster our democracy, engage our community, and continue to shine bright as a beacon for democracy and civic participation in our nation. Congratulations. Now let's get back to work. And Senator Alex Padilla, great words there. And it reminds me a lot of George Takei, who is in the room with us today. I did a wonderful interview with George a while back. And George openly talks about the lessons he learned from his father. And one of the most important lessons was the fact that democracy is not easy. It does take work. And that's what Senator Padilla was saying right there. George, it's great to see you. And thanks for continuing to spread that lesson. I now would like to invite our friend, Consul General Kenko Sone. Consul General Sone has been a longtime supporter of the Los Angeles Japanese American community and their contributions to US-Japan relations. Mr. Sone.
Thank you, thank you David. Uh, good friend, uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, I should say. And I'm Ken Kosone, Consul General of Japan in Los Angeles. First of all, uh, first of all I'd like to congratulate uh, Janon uh, for relaunching the uh, National Center for the Preservation of Democracy as the Daniel K. Inoue National Center for Preservation of Democracy. Uh, by the way, for most of the Japanese, it's rather easier to, to <laughs> pronounce Inoue or Aoki or whatever. It's sometimes the vowel is, combination vowel is for us somehow easy. <laughs> So, um, the late Senator uh, Daniel Inouye is a true hero. He fought bravely in World War II as a part of the 442nd Infant Regiment. He also served the country as the first Japanese-American member of the House of Representatives and later as Senator. He championed democracy throughout his entire life, so it seems very natural that the center has come to bear his name. Senator Inoue was also very active in promoting Japan-U.S. relationship. When I, when I worked at the Embassy of Japan in Washington, D.C. between 2011 and 13, I, I remember that he was, uh, he's always a gracious work on Japanese parliamentary members and supported our embassy activities. In the current global situation, the fate of democracy and its, its fragility are utmost concern. As Japan and the United States work closely together to maintain and strengthen a free and open international order based on the rule of law for realizing free and open Indo-Pacific. The democracy must be preserved as the foundation of our societies. So I hope the activities of the Democracy Center will further enhance the universal value of democracy by promoting various programs for many people, both domestic and foreign, especially younger generation, to participate and learn. Uh, our Consulate General of Japan stands ready to work together with the center for this shared cause. I thank you very much. Thank you, Consul General Sone. We are also honored to have Los Angeles City Controller Kenneth Mejia here with us today. Controller Mejia is the first Filipino American and Asian American to assume citywide office. His dedication to civic engagement and transparency helped make the city of Los Angeles accessible to all. Please welcome Los Angeles City Controller Kenneth Mejia. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to the Japanese American National Museum for inviting me today to celebrate in this joyous occasion of the relaunch of the Daniel K. and I'm hoping I'm saying this, Inoue <laughs> National Center for the Preservation of Democracy. Um, you know, I was just here in October, actually, during a Filipino American History Month. So you could just imagine what this center has provided for so many communities who have endured civil rights challenges throughout the history. And so I, I definitely thank uh, Janem for, for being this space for us. And so during a time when um, democracy is under a constant threat or attack, it's important to have a space like the, the, like the Democracy Center that brings Senator Inouye's vision to life. A place for education and participation. A place that brings communities together to be able to participate in difficult conversations especially on race, identity, and social justice, all of which are very important in the preservation and protection of democracy. And so I have here a certificate on behalf of the city of Los Angeles. Is there uh, um, can we have any of the uh, uh, distinguished guests who have been here in the, in the making of this relaunch happen? Can you please join me? Okay. So. <laughs> I'll just read it off. <laughs> On, <laughs> to the Daniel K. Inouye National Center for the Pres Preservation of Democracy, 
On behalf of the city of Los Angeles and its four million residents, the second largest city in the United States, and the office of the Los Angeles City Controller, we congratulate you on the relaunch of the National Center for the Preservation of Democracy as the Daniel K. Inouye National Center for the Preservation of Democracy. Established more than 20 years ago, the Democracy Center builds upon the founding vision and lasting legacy of Senator Daniel K. Inouye, examining issues about race, identity, and social justice to transform attitudes and secure and enduring democracy for all. Congratulations. Thank you, Controller Mejia. Now, I'd like to introduce another friend of the Japanese American National Museum who recently assumed the role as President and CEO of the California Community Foundation, Miguel Santana. Buenas tardes. <laughs> so it's great being here for many reasons. CCF has been a longtime partner of this center of JANM. We have contributed over $2 million to ensure that this place thrives and represents the best of Los Angeles. And of course, some of you may not know, but Jim Hurd is a CCF alum. He worked as a program officer overseeing all of our arts program several years ago. So you couldn't be in better hands. But I'm here to say thank you for the relaunch. There's no time that's more important than today to have this center ensure that we're having the important conversations about our democracy, about race, and about our history. This is the place that should welcome the conversation on reparations and why we should consider reparations as part of the legacy of accountability and justice in this country. This is a place that should talk about the painful history of racism, not in the South, but here in Los Angeles. The fact that Los Angeles was designed where race was put at the center of planning and how redlining to, from the past contributes to the homeless crisis that we have today. This is a place that should not be afraid to confront the rise of anti-Asian hate, the rise in Islamophobia and anti-Semitism that are scary reminders of the past. And so for CCF, we believe that it's part of our mission to support places that are having these tough conversations. Our board is starting to consider establishing a fund that is specifically focused at advancing what it looks like to be a multiracial democracy. At a time where we wonder if that's even possible, if we don't actively engage in that vision, develop it, and support organizations that are seeking to create what it looks like, it won't just happen. We have to be intentional, and we have to advance it together. Thank you all, and thank you for opening this incredible center. Thank you so much, Mr. Santana. I'd like to bring to the stage a man who has already hit the ground running for the Democracy Center today, co-hosting here at Janum the first day of two weeks of special programs led by the Smithsonian, entitled Our Shared Future, Reckoning with Our Racist Past in Los Angeles. I'll tell you a little bit about our plans for the future of the Democracy Center. So please welcome the first ever director of the Democracy Center, Mr. James E. Herb. Um, some people actually say hair. So, <laughs> I grew up saying her, but then I moved to California and everybody said hair, so I'm like, all right, I guess we're going with that now. Um, but um, 
I'm going to jump off script just a little bit because I do. Um, I want to thank first of all all of our, our Jan and board of directors and our, our board of trustees and our board of governors, um, all of our Jan and members who are out there today. Thank you so much for your continued support. It's been so invaluable to us. Um, I also want to um, recognize um, the Tatuichi family uh, for whom this space is named. Um, and their vision for this years and years ago, and their continued support that they've been providing us. Um, they are actually zooming in somewhere, am I right? <laughs> Hopefully I'm not on mute, am I on mute? No. Um, so thank you so much to them for their continued support. Um, and I also want to thank all of the Janum staffers here. There's a lot of you here in the audience today. Thank you so much. I don't think there was a single department that didn't have some role in, in today's, um, today's proceedings, both the earlier session we had today and today's events and the ones that are going on. Um, it's an incredible time for us right now. Um, and I do want to send out a special thanks to Sofia Alvarez. Um, she is my right hand man. She um, is there with chocolate when I, she knows I need it because I'm getting cranky. Um, but she keeps everything running and everything kind of going um, on track. So, um, so, so blessed to have her here. So do we have, oh, good, we have it on. So if I said the number 16 to you, let's see if this works, if I do it right. Did you turn it on? Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's cool. It's on. Oh, okay. So, 16, if I said the number 16 to you, what does that conjure up in your minds? Prom. Prom? Okay. I was thinking sweet 16. Um, and I'm glad this is now interactive, because that helps me a lot. It really does. Um, anybody else? Yogurt. Yogurt? Yeah. 16 flavors. <laughs> okay. Driver's license. Okay. Sweet 16, that was the one I had written down, so thank you. Um, I, I was also thinking sort of like Sweet 16 in, in the basketball tournaments. Um, if you're a mathlete, do you know what 16 is? What was that? Four square. Four square, but what does that mean? What kind of a square is it? Perfect square. Perfect square. <laughs> Everybody's like, what's a perfect square root? <laughs> it's, the, it's a number whose square root is an integer. So now they're all like, what's a I know. <laughs> um, But if I put a percent sign after it, 16%, what does that kind of, it's not such a great kind of measure for anything, really, 16%. Um, if you were a baseball player and you were batting a 160, you probably wouldn't be in, in the major leagues for very long. Um, so I was really saddened to learn that only 16% of young people in America are proud to live here. And this statistic has actually been kind of steady for a while. Um, over the last couple of years, I thought maybe it was just a matter of, of how we define being proud of something. Because I feel like I can be proud of something and still recognize its faults and want it to do better. Um, but I saw this conversation play out in real life this past year, thanks to our friends at CCEJ and their annual breakfast. Um, over the past few years during the pandemic, they've been convening these um, online events where you talk about issues, but with a, a particular group, a self-selected affinity group. And so when they had this first in-person event, I self-selected into the multiracial, multicultural um, category. And the first thing that I noticed when I walked into the room that really made me sad was that I was the oldest person in the room. I thought to myself, when did this happen to my life? But, um, but really, it was, the conversation was very sobering. Um, and I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to create some sort of like, okay, boomer kind of moment. Um, but what I heard broke my heart because to a person in that room, those young people expressed this very same sentiment, that they were ashamed to be American, that they had no faith in our democracy, and that there was a palpable sense of apathy that I could feel, almost bordering on antipathy. When people don't want to engage, when they don't feel that there's any point to it, or they don't feel democracy is working for them, democracy cannot survive. And these days, you know, antipathy and, and, and apathy are venom to democracy. 
and I feel that there are people that are actually trying to create that venom. But I also know that I had had that feeling myself in the past, that sense of hopelessness, that sense of not belonging, the sense of what's the point. Um, so if you don't mind I'm, I'm indulging me, I'm going to take us down a little path down memory lane to a time when I was little Jimmy Her, and um, please don't ever call me Jimmy. Um, <laughs> And let me preface this by saying, you know, that I feel blessed that where I grew up in the time and place that I did, I had an amazing family. It was incredibly supportive. Um, my father's side of the family welcomed my mother and me without question, which wasn't something that a lot of the friends that I knew who were mixed race um, or mixed race kids knew or, or experienced. Um, I never felt the alienation that plagued them. Um, I also had wonderful friends who maybe didn't necessarily see me for who I was, but certainly didn't judge me for who I am. Um, but it wasn't perfect. I mean, this was a time and a place where my parents, my parents, who just cel would have celebrated their 60th anniversary yesterday, they could not get married in my father's hometown. My mom and I were the only people of color. Um, I was constantly reminded of how, how different I was. I mean, you bring chicken adobo to school one day and you're forever the kid with the weird lunch. I didn't have a Janum, or I didn't have a, a, a Chinese American museum or La Plaza. I didn't have a search to involve Filipino Americans. I, I didn't have the kind of community that I found here in Los Angeles. The closest I could ever hope for is when we'd go to Philadelphia every few months to Chinatown and kind of stock up on rice, noodles, and Chinese sausage for pansit. For mm. um, as different as I was made to feel, though, I felt like I was every, like everyone else. I felt that America's promise was just as real for me as it was for all of my classmates and friends. I felt like I was Obie Taylor and Theodore Cleaver and Bobby Brady all rolled into one person. Um, but it was against that backdrop that I charted my future. You see, when I was a little kid, I knew that one day, I was going to be President of the United States. And I said that longer than it's cute for a kid to say that kind of thing. Um, I was that weird little kid in your class you know, who knew all the states, all the capitals, all the presidents. I think at one time I actually memorized the Declaration of Independence. I knew I was going to go to, to college and to law school, what I was going to study. Um, and so I was not quiet about this dream. In fact, when I was nine years old, my Aunt Jane gave me this game. And it was a board game, and I had never seen it anywhere. And not on TV, um, not in, in the department stores or toy stores, not in the Sears and Roebuck Holiday Wishes catalog, which for those of you who don't know is Amazon in book form. Um, and when I unwrapped, the, uh, unwrapped it, there was, you know, looking at the box, I couldn't figure out what it was. But as I read it, um, it became clear, and I got so excited. I think I may have cried a little bit, um, but I felt so seen in that moment because the name of the game was Landslide, a Parker Brothers game for two to four players ages nine and up. <laughs> I'm going to rephrase that because you may not be able to see it. It is a Parker Brothers game of power politics. <laughs> I was so excited, and I, I, I ripped open the box and I just stared at the contents and, with wonder. Um, the object of the game was to win a presidential election, so, you know. Uh, but the subtext was it was teaching people about the Electoral College. Now back then, nobody cared about the Electoral College, nobody knew what it was. I don't think, you know, even I didn't know what it was. Um, the idea of like somebody winning the popular vote but not becoming president just seemed crazy. And it, it seemed, dare I say, downright undemocratic. And even though I didn't really understand all the workings of that, I loved this game and I played it all the time. I was like a little Nate Silver in training. <laughs> and I wanted to play this game all the time. And you know who loved to play this game with me? Absolutely no one! <laughs> wants to play a game of power politics with a nine-year-old. Like, you know, I was a weird little kid. But it was during one of those times that I was trying to get my friends to play this game with me when a couple of them came up to me and said, you know, you shouldn't bother playing this game because you can't be president. And I said, well, why not? And they said, because you're not American. And I'm like, 
Oh, well, I knew the Constitution, and I was like, I was born in America. I am a natural born citizen. We were born in the same hospitals. They're like, yeah, but you're not really American, you're Filipino. And I'm like, well, my mom's Filipino, but, but, but that doesn't even really matter. And then they said, well, it's, you're not white. Those words like really hit me differently and very unexpectedly. I thought of you know kind of fighting back and saying like, well, my dad's white, like I'm half white, but I knew that half white wasn't good enough. And I had been bullied before and made fun of, but but this was different because this was telling me somehow I didn't belong, that there were going to be things in life that just simply weren't going to be afforded to me. So I responded with something like, well, I'll be the first one. And then I went off and rage played landslide for like four hours. <laughs> I, I don't want you to get me wrong. Like, these were my friends. Like, I, they weren't the ones that bullied me. And I, I think they were trying to tell me this out of concern. They saw the world around us as it was back then. And there was nothing to ever make anybody think that anyone but a white man could be president or serve in the highest levels of government. They were, the, they were kind of just telling me, like, this is not a road you can go down. So sidebar, if you haven't been to the Bias and Sidus exhibition yet um, across the way from the Smithsonian, please go. Because when we talk about the pernicious effects of implicit bias, this is exactly what we're talking about. And so while I may not have believed them at the time, I, that seed of doubt was planted. And as time went on and nothing seemed to change, particularly in my small world, I just eventually felt like, yeah, this is not something that's going to happen for me. And I moved on. When Barack Obama was elected president, I cried that night. I remember calling my father, and we were talking, and we were both so happy. He never thought he would ever see a black man elected president. There were obviously tears of joy that someone who was about my age, he's older, um, <laughs> Who was, in, who was the son of an immigrant from a mixed race family. Um, all the things that people had said about him were like echoed the things I had heard growing up. These people, the things they said about him were terrible, but he always kept going. Because remember, he ran on a platform of hope. And I saw in him someone who hadn't given up on this country or in the belief that this country, as flawed as it may be, would always find the way to good, to the right, and to the just. And I was sad, though. I was sad that I had given up on that hope and in that belief. That's what I saw that day with those, youth, those kids that I was with. I had lost that hope, and I thought to myself how different the world, my world would have been if I had just not given up. And I thought about the millions of other little weird kids around the country who were made to feel the same way, and how different the world would be if we were all given the same chance and the same opportunities. The young people I spoke that, with that day told me they felt that like, their world was being taken away from them. Most of them grew up in a time that I thought we had someone who personified hope and belief in this country when everything seemed possible. But there were also a generation that saw two presidents elected, not by popular vote. It seemed like to them that the voice of the people just didn't matter. And in recent years, they saw groups of people that, they, that were attacking the very rights that they had had for so long. People who did not have the mandate of the people. Their whole belonging to this society was in question. Having lived through a time when, when we saw people fighting for rights, I guess I just figured, well, we'll start again, and we'll organize, and we'll start fighting. And I knew that these amazing organizations in Los Angeles would lead the way. There was this community of support that I never knew existed growing up. But for those who are not used to that kind of severe othering, the sense of alienation was profound. And their sense of marginalization, I think, is going to be very difficult to combat. So that's why I love the work that we are doing here at the Democracy Center. In a world where we see attacks on American democracy every day, we need institutions to speak up and speak out. We need to stem the tide of antipathy. Our role here is to make sure that no weird little kid anywhere is ever made to feel 
that they don't belong, or that they don't have a role in this democracy. And in fact, the very future relies on their participation. You see, it shouldn't matter what you look like or where you come from, who you worship, who you love, what your economic status is, what your immigration status is, or whether you're old or young. We all have roles, rights, and responsibilities within this democracy. And, though, though, and there are those who want to take that away from us for the sake of power. That cuts at the very heart of what it means to be an American. Every day when I walk through that plaza, I hear distant voices and cries of children and families as they didn't know what was going to happen to them when they boarded those buses for the concentration camps. I am reminded how democracy failed its people. And I feel that Senator Inouye also felt that way. And that's why this museum, this center, is in this historic site. It is his remembrance of the past and his vision for the future that guide our work in the Democracy Center. The Daniel K. Inouye National Center for the Preservation of Democracy at the Japanese American National Museum leans on the incredible work that Janet has done over the years. The collections, the story, the people, the community that has been built. We can temporize that story for other communities and work with others for solutions facing the problems of our society and our democracy. We center the arts in these conversations in a way that other institutions don't or can't. We uplift the voices of our heritages, the diverse stories brought here from around the world, not to replace a culture, but to enhance it, to strengthen it, and to allow it to make room for other stories that will make for a truly unique and special American canon of art. One of the programs I'm most excited about is our Empathy and Democracy podcast, born, of, born out of our work with our friends at Gratitude Blooming. It is taped in front of a live audience, and without a net, we talk openly about our struggles with finding empathy and the need to do that because we believe that the only way we can build bridges with other communities is through empathy. But how do we reach out to others who feel that we don't even belong here? How do we do that? And that's not a rhetorical question because I don't know. I have no idea how we do that. I struggle with that question every single day. But we can't let a path that is unseen stop us from finding one or creating one. That is at the very essence of the work that we do, to find those paths, to find those answers. And we also want to inform and educate people on what a functioning democracy looks like, and to ensure that everyone understands their roles, their rights, and their responsibilities. Our distinguished lecture series will bring the most inspiring minds here to the center of our time to talk about these very issues. Our Watanabe Fellowship will cast a spotlight on the developing leadership capabilities of early and mid-career professionals across borders. We will give artists and young people an opportunity to share their stories, share our culture, uplift their voices, and inspire us to do the hard work to protect this democracy. Democracy is people power, literally people power. And so we must stand against those who want to take that power away from us and put it in the hands of a few. But democracy is not majority rules, nor is it the concentration of power in a ruling class. Democracy is all of us working together, moving everyone forward. All too often we are guilty, and I do mean all of us, of thinking that it's okay to leave other people behind, especially in this society. And we simply cannot do that. For democracy to survive, we must work together to make sure that everyone participates, that everyone benefits. And it's not easy work, to your point. But it, nothing, it, nothing that is ever easy is ever worth it. And so that's why I ask you to join us in this work. We cannot do it alone. So come to our programs. Tell others about our programs. Like and follow us on social media. <laughs> Merchants and bio. Um, come to us with your, your ideas. You know, we want to be a place that welcomes those. And while we would love to be able to program this space every single day, and we know we could find the content, we need the help to build the capacity to do that. 
So join us on this journey. It is probably one of the most important journeys that we can take together. As I said earlier, this was a place where, where democracy failed its people. But in truth, through division, prejudice, and apathy, it is the people that failed their democracy. But it is also the people that have the power to preserve, protect, and defend it. So join us in this work, please. And let that be our charge for the future so that no one is left behind. Thank you. special guest that we'd like to bring up um, and she represents the namesake of the Democracy Center and probably will say it correctly um, um, and representing of course the Daniel K. Inouye Institute. All of us of Denim are so proud of this relationship and the Inouye Institute is where the Senators laid papers and effects are housed and it is our sincere hope that together our organizations will build a legacy up for this American hero and that he is known as the true statesman, sharing his values with future generations. The senator stood out for his bipartisanship, his moral courage, and his deep desire to build bridges across the world. As the director of the Inouye Institute, Jennifer Sabas is dedicated to sharing the late Senator Inouye's legacy, and as the senator's longtime chief of staff for over 20 years, she embodies these core values as well. We are so fortunate and happy, and happy to have her here with us this special evening. Please join me in welcoming and thanking our partner, Jennifer Savatz. Good afternoon and aloha. 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 So I have to say, in all the years I worked for Senator Inouye, we had a piece of paper that everyone had in their office, and it was how to say his name phonetically. Right? Council General said it like perfectly. Phonetically, it is E dash N O dash W A Y. E no way. That was the Washington, D.C. version of how to pronounce his name correctly. As was mentioned, I had the amazing good fortune to have worked for Senator Danny Noe for more than 25 years in both Washington and Honolulu. And I will tell you that it was the most amazing living lesson on leadership. Danny Noe led by example, and what he taught us was that when you see something that isn't right, don't look away. Look at it, say something, and then do something. I was the legislative staff for him on the Japanese American redress. Senator Spark Matsunaga, Congressman Maneta and Matsui worked very hard to pass the measure that authorized the apology and the re redress payments. Senator Inouye's job was to get the money to fund it. And he promised Spark on his deathbed that he would get the job done. And was, so his strategy involved legislating an entitlement so the fund looked like Social Security and ensured that it went until it was done. But to be successful, he needed to talk and get a block of Southern Democrats to vote with him. Yes, there were Democrats in the South back in the day. <laughs> and I remember it so distinctly, the conversation between senators, which turned to, which is so fitting um, with the conversations that occurred earlier, that turned to other aggrieved groups who may also want to see reparations. This was in the 90s. It was such an offensive conversation. But my boss was so focused, and he was not going to de get derailed in his quest to be, to be able to deliver his promise to Spark and the broader Japanese American community. And the rest was history. One more example I want to share with you is a tragic history of, of Native Americans. He could not look away. Danny Noy became the first chairman of the full committee on Indian affairs. Why? We have no Indians in Hawaii. The reason was there was no other senator 
that would take the responsibility. And when he agreed to it, the majority leader at the time said, well, Dan, you at least look like them. And so he proceeded to use everything he had to seek equity for all the treaties that our nation broke against our Native American friends, culminating with the push for the Smithsonian's Museum on the American Indian. To be able to rightly tell the story of the first people of this land, including Native Hawaiians and Alaska Natives. You see, I could go on and on. Filipino Americans from World War II, Arab Americans in Detroit after 9-11, they found their champion in Danny Noy. So our institute is honored to have the center bear his name. And what I'd like to leave you with is if there is an injustice, do not look away. Call it out and then do something about it. The senator was very fond in his later years of saying that America is an amazing country and that there is no other country in the world where the grandson of Japanese immigrants who came to this land to work on the sugarcane fields in search of a better life, who would be deemed 4C or enemy alien at the start of World War II solely because of the color of his skin and would go on to fight for the right to defend this nation as a member of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the most decorated unit of its size in military history, for which he would receive the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest award for military valor. And he would go on still to serve for nearly 50 years in the United States Senate, becoming the President Pro Tem and third third in succession to the presidency. His portrait now hangs in the US Capitol as a part of the Senate Leadership Series, the first one of color in our history. Only in America, he would say, if you are prepared to work hard, dream big, and never give up. Aloha and God bless. Beautiful speech, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Uh, and Jim, you too. Great. Wonderful, wonderful speeches here. And if I could beat a dead horse, back in the day when I was bringing Defining Courage to Hawaii, people said, get Jennifer on your team. She's the most powerful person in all of Hawaii. <laughs> and she certainly does make things happen. But this is the beating the dead horse part. We were calling her Jennifer Sabas over and over, and she just... <laughs> and then I speak to some of my friends in Hawaii just a couple weeks ago, and then they, they said, oh, my friend Jennifer Sabas. And I'm like, oh, it's Sabas? We've been mispronouncing it. Well, then I talked to Jennifer today, and she says it's actually Sebas. <laughs> and it just seems to be the theme. Um, appropriately so. But thank you so much, Jennifer, for your partnership and to continue the legacy and the vision of the late Senator Inouye. And for this Democracy Center, the importance of teaching people about the lessons of democracy. And before we conclude today's program, it is my pleasure to introduce Janum's board chair, who has the name that should be the hardest of the day, but it's actually the easiest, Mr. Bill Fujioka. Bill and Ann Burroughs' vision and leadership is what led the path to today in our relaunching of the Democracy Center. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Fujioka. When you have events like this, there's a number of speakers. And then you have someone like me who has to follow Jim. And for the one time and only one time, because Jim would kill me, Jimmy. And Jennifer. Because when they spoke, especially when Jim spoke, the emotions were, I got to tell you, very, very deep. Because he spoke of his experience as a young Filipino boy. But each one of you in this room can speak to the experience based on your ethnicity and your background. 
for me, I'm a proud Japanese American. At one point, some of you know my background. This isn't my speech, right? I'll get to it. But it was just overwhelming of what he said. You know, I worked in government for 44 years. I ran a hospital in Animal Valley. And I was giving a speech at a very large event, primarily Republicans. And this one woman stared at me. She was the wife of a very powerful senator and said, keep speaking. It's amazing you speak English. <laughs> And I said, ma'am, I was born here. And behind me was a supervisor's deputy saying, don't say anything, that <laughs> senator's wife. I said, ma'am, I was born here. I'm an American. She go, you can't be. You're an ornamental. I'm not an oriental. You're an ornamental. <laughs> that wasn't too long ago. But I want to say thank you and good afternoon on behalf of the Jan Board of Trustees and Governors and the staff. Today we relaunched a newly named Daniel K. Inouye, <laughs> National Center for Pres Preservation Democracy. He made, these two people made me very emotional. It's a very special day for us today. We at Janum are very, very proud to rename the center in his honor because it was his vision for the center to be a place where individuals from diverse communities, and I mean all communities, are welcome here. Diverse communities to come together to actively engage in discussing and advocating the need for a stronger democracy. He envisioned this as a place where we can come and feel free and feel safe to express our views. We may have differing views, we may not always agree, but the importance of discussion, despite the fact that there may be disagreement, there's always the hope that when it's all said and done, we reach, a, we reach agreement, or at very little, at very least, an understanding of the importance of democracy. You know what's real interesting, little side, little side note, you all know about the story of Stanley Hayami. He's been one of our future programs here at Janum. His diary is one of our most valuable possessions. Senator Inouye was, Daniel, uh, was uh, Stanley Hayami's platoon leader. I would go to DC in my job on many occasions because uh, Stanley Hayami was my, my father's cousin. And one day I said, you know, Stanley Hayami was my dad's cousin. And he started talking to me about him. And Stanley was there when the senator got injured. But that's the connections we have within the Japanese American community. If all of us talk long enough, you say, wait a minute, you might be my cousin. <laughs> but at least we're family from the same community. Now, the NCPD programming will focus on the importance of preserving democracy. Part of this effort you heard. We're going to have a distinguished lecture series named after the two pillars of our foundation for Janum. One, of course, is the senator. The second is Irene Hirano. She was our founder and our first president and CEO. And her spirit still lives here at Janum, whether it's in this building or the historic building or the new museum. It's very, very important as we go forward with these programs that we do it in the context of the Japanese American experience. It's important because here at Janum, our mission is not only to preserve the stories and history of the Japanese American community, but to retell those stories with the hope and the goal to ensure what happened to the Japanese American community in World War II never happens again to any other community. A lot of you know, because I see a lot of faces here from our community, that this courtyard outside is where the buses came and our family was forced onto the buses and taken to first assembly centers and concentration camps. My entire family boarded the bus in this courtyard. I spent 44 years in government I've been retired 10 years. Yeah, I'm old. Not old the gym. But when I was asked to come and join the board by 
by um, um, Norm, Norman, Secretary of Veneta. It was something that lit a kind of a spark in me. And so you have a vocation in your life. It was your job. But you're blessed if you're able to give and the opportunity to practice it, your application. This is it for me. Now I want to personally thank and highlight Jim Hurd. For a lot of us, and a lot of you, it might have been the first time you heard this man speak at length. But it's important. I think you all saw, you all heard, you all witnessed what Jim will bring to the National Center for Preservation and Democracy. He brings a personal and professional dedication and vision to the center's mission. In the short time I've known him, you can feel that he's a man of integrity, of character, and that he'll be a champion of social justice, equity, and inclusion. I'm very proud to be able to work with this man, and I want all of, all, all of us to thank him. So, my thanks to everyone today. Your presence is very much appreciated. This will be a place where we can all come together and invite different communities to talk about the importance of democracy, the importance of social justice, the importance of equity. This will be a place we can be very, very proud of. This is a place that did not exist in World War II. It even didn't exist 20 years ago. But this is a place that we hope will provide a platform to celebrate being an American, but also emphasize the importance of democracy. Together, we can work to secure an enduring and just democracy for all. And so with that, I thank you for your support. I'm hoping to thank you for your investment. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to plug that in there. <laughs> because it doesn't happen, folks, by accident. It doesn't happen without the involvement of the entire community. There's, there's a, the old adage about it takes a village. Well, folks, it takes a much larger village to do what we would like to achieve. So thank you very much, and thank you for coming today. Thank you so much, Bill. And what a great afternoon this has been. Thank everyone here today for your support of the Democracy Center. We're excited to see some of the programs that are coming our way. Uh, you can learn more about how to get involved and upcoming programming at janum.org slash democracy. janum.org slash democracy. Now, as we conclude the speaking portion of our program, I have the honor of inviting you all to head across the plaza to Janum's beautiful Artani Central Hall for a reception where you also have the opportunity to visit the new exhibit sponsored by the Democracy Center, The Bias Inside of Us. And one final note, we'll be taking a, a photo uh, for uh, the Board of Trustees and Governors just outside. Please meet in front of the step and repeat where the Tycho we're performing a little bit earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. We'll see you at the reception.